Welcome, everybody, to the Thunder Junction Common and Uncommon Limited Level Up Set Review. We're back. I'm Alex. He's Mark. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great. A uh, little bit of a cough, so I'll try my best to mute as much as I can when that's happening, but super happy to be here as always, and thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. These are a lot of fun. Uh, they're informative, of course, too, hopefully. The purpose of set reviews, I always like to say this uh, beforehand, is not to nail down every single card exactly, hey, by the end of the format... This is the grade it's going to have, but it's to learn the cards, it's to hear some thoughts, to figure out where you disagree with me and Mark, where you agree. I think the disagreements are definitely the most interesting parts, and seeing where me and Mark disagree. I think that's also really interesting. Uh, I was just talking to Chad here before we started. Today, like I mentioned, we're doing the commons and uncommons. Tomorrow, we're doing the rares and mythics, and you know, there's a lot of cards in this set. There's a lot of words on the cards in this set. We're going to try to keep it as brief as possible. But buckle up, we do have a lot to talk about because it's a, as per usual these days, a pretty complex set. Uh, we're going to be doing, just as we usually do, the limited resources style A to F letter grade. I'm sure most of you are, uh, or so the grading system, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. But if you're not, it's pretty straightforward. A's, those are your best cards. B's, those are pulls into the color, uh, but not quite bombs like the A's are. Your C's are, like uh, Luis likes to say, the pawns of limited. And uh, like Mark likes to say often, the C pluses are the cards that you almost never cut from your deck. These are the ones that will... I actually heard somebody in the limited level up Discord describe them as cards that will increase your win rate if you just put them in your deck. And I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, your D's are your hmm, not-so-great cards, your situational cards, and your F's are... Pretty much you should never play these, but uh, you know, there's like the grade of F plus sometimes when there's some very, very niche situations. Uh, yeah, before we jump in, anything else that, uh, you think we should cover, Mark? Uh, no, I think you've got these intros pretty much down pat, and, uh, yeah, I think, especially with new play boosters, especially the commons, a lot of them do fall in the kind of D plus to B minus range, mm -hmm. like, which sounds like it's roughly the same grade, so I do think it's kind of worth no noticing a little bit what we give a C versus a C plus versus a C minus because yep. I do think there's some nuance there but uh, for those who have been around this multiple times nothing's really changing I think it's going to be a good set and a lot of cards that look pretty interesting so let's uh, let's dive into it yeah absolutely one last thing I do want to call out here is the order we're going in uh, we start with the gold cards there are two gold cards for each color pair this time around then we're going to be doing the artifacts and the lands. There's quite a few lands in the set to cover. And then we're going Wooburg order. The rest of the colors, the monocolor cards, going from lowest mana cost, from the one mana cost cards, up to the expensive cards in mana cost order. Kind of gives you a good idea of just the curve. And you can see kind of like, you know, sometimes we like to do it this way because sometimes you can see some like nice one-two punches of, oh, you play this on two, you play this on three. It's a nice little combo it's just a little bit better than going alphabetically i think uh before we jump into the actual cards we did actually kind of want to cover one little thing here uh and that is the play boosters this time around and what they look like because they are slightly different than the mkm ones where the the layout of the pack is slightly tweaked so in the in these boosters we've got six commons three uncommons one slot where there's a card of any rarity, including Booster Fun, which is one of the many uh, bonus sheets in this set. We'll get to that later. One rare mythic, one borderless breaking news card. And these are this is the bonus sheet that is in the set. The, the breaking news bonus sheet. All the cards on this bonus sheet, they have the theme of they all commit a crime. So you're going to see a lot of removal spells on this set on this sheet. There is one of these cards per pack. So it's going to be something that you see uh, basically well, you know, all the time. Then there is a foil slot. This could be any rarity and a land slot. And the land slot is notable in the set because there are common dual lands. And the fine print on this, if you're not watching, uh, or if you are watching and can't see the fine print, says common dual lands in 50% of packs, full arch western lands in 16% of packs, basic lands in 34% of packs, and traditional foil uh, card foil lands in 20% of packs. So that's what we're in for. And we actually have 14 cards in these packs, correct? If I'm counting correctly, we're, we're back up to 14. We're like in MKM, we get 13. Yes. So for those who played uh, Karlov Manor, there's not a ton of differences here. For those who haven't played a play booster set, this is going to be really different. But for anyone who played a lot of Karlov Manor, the, the TLDR, I guess the Coles Notes version of this, you get one less common, which is replaced by the bonus sheet with the crimes. So... 
even though you already thought there was maybe not too many comments seen in Carl of Mander, there's going to be even less this time. But you also get basically half of an extra card per pack because of that land frequency. So on Arena for Carl of Manor, all of the basic lands were just removed from the pack because there was no need to have them drafted. So now you will see basics appear in 50% of the packs and then the new dual, com the common duels in the other 50% of the packs. So a bit better in terms of depth, like more things are going to wheel because there's an extra card per pack, but even less dependency on commons than usual compared to the previous set. Yeah, exactly. So let's just jump right in. So we're going to go for uh, the blue-white gold cards first. We've got Gem Lightfoot Sky Explorer. So this is two white-blue for a legendary creature. Uh, it is a 3-3 three, three flying vigilance creature, and it says at the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, draw a card. So if you're reading this for the first time and you haven't seen any cards in this set, it might be a little bit perplexing of a card, but what's going on here? Yeah, so the there's two ways of triggering this without just kind of time walking yourself and doing nothing. The first is, of course, being able to play instance on your opponent's turn and you can trigger this. The second way of doing this is a new ability called Plot. Uh, we will be getting to Plot very shortly as soon as we hit the commons. I don't think there's there's oh i guess there's an instant of it on blue green that explains what it is but plot you can basically exile a card from your hand for its plot cost and then cast it from exile for free on a later turn and so that both plotting something and casting something from plot would not count as casting a spell from your hand so you could still be uh, adding to your board and producing your gameplay without actually stopping yourself from drawing a card from gem yeah, you could, you can also, you know, another way to activate this, somebody in the chat actually said the same thing here, I was just about to say, activating an activated ability, there's a few ways that they have seeded activated abilities in this set on creatures, on enchantments, so you have ways to spend your mana, still do things, not actually time walk yourself and draw your card if you'd want, uh, but what do we think of Gem Lightfoot here? It's four mana, three, three, flying vigilance, that's solid, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a respectable body, and, you know, if it can stick around... That's, it's a big if, but if it sticks around, you're going to draw some cards. Yeah, we've seen a lot of cards like this over the past couple of years that have always kind of underperformed, where they're slightly below stats, and then they need you to untap to do something. Uh, one recent example was Faramir in the Lord of the Rings set, which looked like a good card, but then it didn't really play out that well because it was just a 3-3 three, three for 4. Uh, I do think that Flying and Vigilance are relevant upgrades mm -hmm. so the body on this isn't embarrassing and i actually don't think this card's that bad without thinking it's great either so right. kind of a middle of the road great from the, from the get-go here yeah uh one thing that if you've watched or listened to any of my content before I, I tend to tread upon this idea that i really want my four mana creatures to either have some sort of protection ward or an enter the battlefield effect an immediate effect because if this gets killed by a two mana removal spell you lose out on that exchange you, you kind of fall behind in the game in a non-obvious way but if it has enough upside you know even if it doesn't untap so you, you kind of like just balancing on average how good will this card be when you play it I'm, I'm still willing to entertain the idea of the card so i think a lot, a lot of people look at this and just like oh it's just all upside i don't see exactly it that like that kind of like you're saying somewhere in the middle i think to you know i'll put my uh my toe in the water here first i'm gonna give gem lightfoot a b minus a B minus. I was going to go lower than that. Yep. Because uh, I do think there's going to be a ton of interaction in the set with the crime sheet mm -hmm. and people. Like, you're not really going to have a target that must be answered before turn four. So, probably the first removal spell your opponent plays is going to hit this most of the time. Uh, I was just going to give it a C. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I I, I was like teetering on C plus or B minus. I, I think I'm still going to stick slightly high on, on my B minus because I, I do think this has like a good chance of. The other thing I was thinking about this card is, you know, on curve, we tend to think of cards on curve, but, you know, you top deck this late after your opponents kind of use their removal spells and you don't have much in hand, maybe, then it's going to start drawing you some cards then, too. So I, I definitely could see, you know, my, my own rule that I was like, oh, you know, you, you don't want to be uh, thinking about these no ETB creatures too highly. I might be breaking my own rule here, but I'll stick with my B minus. All right. Next up, we've got the second blue white uncommon here. Uh, we've got Wrangler of the Damned. This is 5 mana, 3 blue white for a 1-4. It's got flash. And it says, at the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, you make a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying. Yeah, interesting card. Mm -hmm. Expensive, but eh, just, just like gem. It's like, well, if it sticks around. 
Yeah, th when this one was first spoiled, I actually initially thought that this was just going to be like a straight F. Mm -hmm. Like it, it looks like it's so much worse than it is because you need to, on turn five, you're, you know, passing with mana up, which could mean a bunch of things, but you're not, you know, really adding to your board. And then you pass the turn. And then are you really going to like flash this in and block something because combat tricks and removal spells you're leaving yourselves open to. Mm -hmm. So maybe you play at end of turn and then you untap on turn six and then you're also not adding to the board on turn six. Right. So those are kind of key turns to really not be doing anything. And your payoff is kind of like a one, four and a two, two flyer. But the more I thought about it, I do think my guess was that both of these cards in blue white might have started off being a little better and then I think this there's enough support for this archetype that there's probably a real deck here. So I'm not going to give this an F, but I don't think it's a good card either. Yeah, one thing to note is there are, they've seeded quite a few creatures with Flash so that you're not just based, you know, you don't have to be a strictly spell and sorcery based game plan. You've got like Flash flying creatures and stuff like that. So it, it is a big ass though. I, I And I felt the exact same when I saw it. I was like, oh, this, this is the Blue White Uncommon or at least one of them. I think the payoff here is better than gem. Like I think making a two two every turn is a bit better than drawing a card, but the body's so much worse. So, I, uh, you know, I, I said my grade last last time first. What are you gonna give it? I'm gonna go C minus. I kind of mm -hmm. see this as a card where, like the the text of it is kind of like a build around ish grade, but I think you kind of already need to be the deck. You already need to have a ton of support to to take this. So I think this is the kind of card you don't really want in in pack one, but pack two, if you've already got like a bunch of instants and a bunch of plot cards, and you're not really giving up much to trigger this repeatedly, because you really want to do trigger this repeatedly, right? Like if you're just holding a bunch of, of creatures in your hand and you draw this, it's absolutely terrible. So I'm, I'm going to go C minus, but yeah, these blue white cards, I could see them going either way, depending on how good the archetype is. Yeah, I was thinking that too. One way to think about this is like, if you have a, a good blue white deck, what what number of you know if you're rating all your cards best to worst one to one to twenty three, where does this slot in in a good blue white deck? It's probably closer to twenty three than it is to one, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I was gonna say the exact same thing. I'll join you at C minus for Wrangler of the Dance. Okay. All right, next up, blue black. We've got an intimidation campaign. This is one blue black for an enchantment. It says when intimidation campaign enters the battlefield, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life, and you draw a card. Whenever you commit a crime, you may return Intimidation Campaign to its owner's hand. So this is our first instance of committing a crime. And what committing a crime means is basically if you are if, if you do anything that is directed at your opponent, you can target an opponent's creature, you can target an opponent, you can target an opponent's graveyard, you can target a spell or ability they have on their stat, on the stack, interact with them in any, any way, and you get to trigger this. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, similar to like the callback of disinformation campaign, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, that one was draw discard instead of the drain draw. I, I don't think there was a drain on that as well. I don't. I didn't no, no, no. Set. It was just draw discard. Um, but I do think it's going to be pretty easy to commit a lot of crimes in this set. Yeah, well, one thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'll comment on that first. I I agree. I think that uh, just quick aside on the committing a crime mechanic, I see it more as a gameplay puzzle you're gonna have to solve rather than a deck building puzzle usually when you look at a card you're like okay this card wants me to do this so i should draft cards that do this thing it's really not hard to have a bunch of things that target and of course in this set they've seeded things that make it even easier for you to target they're like for example there's like a two mana black creature that comes in two mana two two lifelink that mills target target player so that just commits a crime right there's just like all these little things that make it very easy to actually commit a crime so I think it's more of a gameplay puzzle you're solving. When are you doing these things? And one little note is that a lot of these um, committing a crime payoffs, they do say, either they say once per turn, or they have a mana cost associated with them. So you're, you can't just like go off being like, oh, trigger, 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 trigger. It's very gated, right? Um, so it's going to be that puzzle of figuring out, okay, should I cast my removal spell on my turn? So I can pick up my campaign and replay it. Should I wait past the turn so I can maybe I think they're going to go for a combat trick and I can save that removal spell for that that key time. Uh, yeah, and, and of course we're going to see more committing a crime cards. We'll talk about the the mechanic more at length there. But 
one thing, if you have, you know, the, the comparison you made there is to disinformation campaign. I actually think this is a little bit closer to Dovin's Acuity, which is another card that was very similar. It actually, uh, it was a blue-white enchantment that came in, draw a card, and gain two life. And then when you cast a instant on your turn, you picked it up. And I think this is actually a little more similar to that, because you're not, like, grinding them out, you're not making them discard, and... The gaining life, that really matters for this kind of game plan. The, the, the lose one, like, that, that matters some amount. But I think mostly you're looking at this as, like, a way to stay alive and grind out value. Life gain plus drawing cards is always a good combo. Um, <laughs> question is, you know, those cards are five, from five years ago. Do they stand up today? Yeah, yeah. I didn't play either of those sets, but I do know that they were both quite strong build-around engines. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, for both plot that we talked about before and crimes they're not and and we'll even see you know outlaws soon to you know to kind of bury the lead here all of these themes are not nestled in like a, a color pair or even like a wedge mm -hmm. right it's not like a two or three color thing they're pretty evenly spread across almost all five colors so you talked about not really having to draft around like committing crimes but you could have these interesting spots where during the draft you're somewhat staying flexible between well am i like a blue black deck or am I a crime deck trying to like splash different things and, and play different puzzles here? So I, I really think there's going to be a lot of tension during the draft. And when you see cards like this, it will change your pick order for the rest of it. Right. Yeah, that's fair enough. So where do we want to give a grade? I, I think I'm going to start pretty high on this card and it might be colored by those old cards being good. Um, but I, I was going to give In Intimidation Campaign a B. Okay, are you going to cast this on turn three, I guess is my question. I think so. I think some amount of the time. I, I think you won't feel too, too bad about it because gaining a life offsets it a little bit. I don't think it's going to be your default. Let me put it this way. It's not going to be your default, but I don't think you're going to be like, oh, I guess I have to cast this here instead of doing something. Yeah, I, I'm i interested in this set in how much the pendulum is going to swing between more like more aggressive mm -hmm. and more the tempo whatever the tempo value or the aggressive control spectrum because especially a card like this could have drastically different stats in the first two weeks of a set on arena where everyone's yes. kind of just insane curves and tons of uncommons versus weeks three plus where you have a little bit more time to breathe um so we're, we're going to grade this as if the set's you know solved and we're in week 20 and the, the final stats and i do think it'll do fairly well, but I wouldn't be surprised if people start trying to build around this early on and mm -hmm. we're like, oh, this set sucks. Like, I can't even do this. <laughs> I just got run over when I cast it on turn three. Yeah, I think but, that's... Anyways, that's my grade. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little lower on this than you as well. I'm going to go a C plus on this because I do think that you will... Like, if there's a turn to take off, turns two, three, and four are not really the ones you want to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I totally agree. I think you're not, like... You're not gunning to play this on turn three. And I think just one thing to what Mark just said, I would really hammer that home if you're somebody who doesn't uh, doesn't like the the kind of faster pace of draft sets that have been happening in the past year. Things do slow down quite a bit on week three, where what happens, the dynamic at play here, and again, I'm not going to go too deep on this, but basically what happens is early on, you got this giant player pool who is going to, you know, a bunch of people are just going to draft whatever. Maybe they're not that great of drafters. And... And you're, when you're playing in Platinum and Diamond and Mythic, you're going to play against a lot of people who know what's going on, who know how to value cheap cards properly. And just like an MKM, you're going to face like red-white aggro a lot of the time week one because people are the tables are just going to give people those decks. They're all going to kind of rise up to the higher ranks. And as the formats go on, they do slow down because, well, people kind of figure out what the good cards are. People know how to value the cheap cards. Not all the cheap cards go to one player. So I like what you said about valuing this as if it's week two, three, four, five or something, not just on week one. Yeah. All right. So let's go on to Blue Black Second on Common here. Lazav, Familiar Stranger. Lazav, back again. I feel like he pops up a lot now. One Blue Black for a 1-4 legendary creature. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one, plus one counter on Lazav. Then you may exile a card from, your gra from a graveyard. If a creature card was exiled this way, you can have Lazav become a copy of that card until end of turn. This ability triggers only once per turn. Yeah, so this is more kind of what I see as what you want to do on turn three. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like, if you're going to be committing a lot of crimes, even just 
having the stats right from the get-go and an ability that's going to trigger later is is more what I, so i actually like this i like this more than intimidation campaign mm -hmm. even though it's much less of an engine like a lot, a lot less potentially scarier i think this still is going to be a better card oh yeah no i i like this card a lot too i i was going to like you know given the choice of playing this on turn three or in a campaign yeah absolutely i think this is about like i'm, I'm gonna give it the same grade just kind of to compare the two here better on turn three and it's kind of what you said too but i'm just gonna thaw it out here this is better on turn three campaigns better later and they're vice versa so i we're gonna again we're gonna see how the set plays out and how it uh the speed of the format plays out but i was gonna give lozava b2 it's a good body but getting one counter on it's good this commits a crime helps you commit a crime exiling something from your grave or from your opponent's grave kind of does a lot of little things it, well, it doesn't, uh, it triggers off committing crimes, but it doesn't oh, true. actually commit a crime, Yes, right? yes, that's fair. Exile a card. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not target card. Very important. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of cards like that where the payoffs aren't enablers. Mm -hmm. Just, again, to stop the ball from rolling for some of the cards that are not gated. Um, which is, you know, almost certainly designed on purpose and, yeah. and really cleanly done. But that, yeah, I totally agree with you. Top deck, much rather have Intimidation Campaign. On turn three, much rather have Lazav. But especially in my blue-black decks, where I'm probably going to be drawing cards and plotting things, I don't think I'll have as much time catching up on the value side. I'm more worried about getting run over. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why I think like these types of cards are just going to do better. I'm still just going to go B-. minus. I'm not like super high on any of these gold cards. I just think it's good. Sweet. Yeah. Moving on to red-black now. We've got Vile Smasher, Gleeful Grenadier. So this is red-black for a 3-2. It's a legendary creature. Goblin mercenary which is going to be important here whenever another outlaw enters the battlefield under your control vile smasher deals one damage to target opponent so this is the first instance of outlaws was just a grouping of creature types and the outlaws are assassins mercenaries pirates rogues and warlocks these are all your outlaw creatures and yeah you get vile smasher here it's a good body i think uh an underrated thing is having a three power two drop that that changes the math on how fast your clock is quite substantially helps you trigger crimes deals incidental damage yeah not not a lot to hate here yeah this is one of the scarier two drops in the set mm -hmm. which yeah. is, is saying a lot because if, if it gets to attack fantastic if it doesn't get to attack it's probably still doing something for you yeah exactly no that, that's a great point right just the the value you get of just being like, yeah, this gets in twice if you you have a cheap removal spell or just the opponent was a little bit slow. Maybe they cast their uh, their, their campaign when <laughs> you know, you're know you doing this kind of stuff and you get into a free hit. And yeah, that's, that's what you're looking for for your two drop, right? Just being able to be relevant as the game goes on and Vile Smasher does that while helping you go through, you know, kind of trigger some engines if you've got some uh, some stuff that cares about committing a crime. I uh, Yeah, I like Vile Smasher. I, I think I'm just going to give it a, a B mine maybe, maybe just a b like this is one that kind of like some of the ones we saw before it's going to very much depend where you want to take this is going to depend on how good this deck ends up being i could see it being closer to a c plus i could see closer being closer to a b i guess i'll average that out i i'll give uh, the stamp i'll give it on is a b minus for vile smasher okay i'm gonna flip with you on this one i think this is my favorite uncommon so far i'm gonna go up to b for this nice sweet yeah uh, we've got at knife point here. It's one black red for an enchantment. It says, as long as it's your turn, outlaws you control have first strike. Whenever you commit a crime, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gains plus one, or gets plus one plus O oh until end of turn. Activate this only as a sorcery. And this ability of making a token triggers only once per turn. So this is our first instance of mercenary tokens, which is just something, not like a full mechanic necessarily, but it's kind of the token of the set where these 1-1 one, one mercenaries that tap to give something plus 1, plus 0 at sorcery speed. Yeah, and we've had the theme tokens for a couple sets have 1-1s one, or 2-2s two, where they can't block. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, the fact that these things can block is great. And then that ability is is no joke. Yeah. Right? Like being able to pump something, especially the, the idea here is your creatures have first strike, so boosting their power makes it even more effective. But uh, this thing is pretty slow to get going. It is, yeah. Like if you're imagining the kind of deck that Vile Smasher goes in, where you're pretty, you know, pretty aggressive, how often do you want to play this on turn three? We're going back to the the, the campaign thing where it's like, oh, you don't want to play this on turn three. You kind of do because you want to get this down before you cast your removal spells. But 
your aggro deck doesn't want to not play a creature on turn three. So I, I think this is more of going to be like a play something on two, play something on three, play something on four, double spell with this on five, or maybe play this on four and lose that on a mana or play like, play like a desert. That's actually not bad, right? On turn four, you play this, you attack with your two and three, then you play a, a desert, which pings your opponent, commits a crime. There's something there. Yeah, it's uh, I totally agree with you. It's just awkward as to when you actually want to play it. It does combo really nicely with Vile Smasher that we just saw because mm. oh, yeah. all you need to do is either cast a Mercenary from your hand and then you trigger Vile Smasher, which triggers the knife point, yeah. <laughs> or you commit a crime, which triggers Vile Smasher. So like, there's some snowball-y stuff there, but I do think that it's like an aggressive card that doesn't actually have any any progression of your board to tempo and I think I'm going to give this like a D plus. Like, I don't think it's actually that good. Yeah, it's weirdly like a, a value card, but the value that you're getting is not something that a quote unquote value deck would necessarily want. I, I agree. I am going to start quite low on this. I, I was just going to give it a D, even just to be a little bit lower than you on it. Um, but yeah, it's it, it could be, you, you know, it could be the, the kind of game plan or the kind of, uh, you know, t uh, cadence of the game where... The aggro decks in the format come off to a pretty fast start, but then they need something to push them through. They need some sort of engine. If that's the case, this kind of does the job. But a lot of decks, uh, you know, that are aggressive decks tend to just be like, all right, I'm just going to have all my cards be one direction. I don't care if the game goes a little bit long. I'm just hoping it doesn't happen that way. If that's the case, knife point's going to be a little bit worse. Uh, yeah. All right, so we've got red green. Jolene, Plundering Pugilist here. One green red for a human mercenary, legendary creature. It's a 4-2. And it says, whenever you attack with one or more creatures with power 4 or greater, you create a treasure token. Has an activated ability here. One in a red, sack a treasure. Jolene deals one damage to any target. Hmm. Yeah, we've seen this red-green 4 power theme quite often. Um, I think they got close to making it good in Wilds of Eldraine. Like, there was decks where I was like, yeah, I really want, you know, a four-power creature in play. And this set, I'm optimistic, because not yeah. only are the creatures often, like, super statted and huge, but for a card like this, where all you need is an attack trigger instead of a cast trigger, we do have stuff like the Mercenary Tokens mm -hmm. that can pump your three-power creatures and get them up to what they need to be. And, of course, this is also self-enabling as well. So... I do think this is probably the best supported four power theme we've ever seen. And we'll we'll see what that means because typically the red green pairs with that, that theme are not doing as well. But I'm optimistic for this one. Yeah, the self triggering is a big thing. Like your opponent really wants to kill this because like if you've played with any of these cards that just attack and make a treasure, really puts you pretty far ahead. Uh so if you just get to untap with Jolene, get in one attack. You're not like thrilled if it trades off, but there's gonna be a lot of spots where you're you don't mind it because then you just get to play, uh, you know, you get to double spell in a really nice way, or you get to get to play something a little bit ahead of schedule. And yeah, the game goes on. She's gonna accrue some value. So, yeah, I like Jolina like a B minus. Yeah, I think I'll join you there. Sweet. All right, uh, this card, this next card, Red Green's other card, also gives me some hope for Red Green. Cactus Folk Sure Shot. This is two Red Green for a four four reach. It's a plant mercenary. It's got Ward 2, which is a big deal. At the beginning of combat on your turn, other creatures you control with power 4 or greater gain Trample and Haste until end of turn. So the, the reason I say it's a big deal is going back to Gem Lightfoot, the whole spiel I gave about, oh, you know, you really want your 4 power creatures to either have an Enter the Battlefield effect or have some sort of protection. And Ward 2 definitely counts. Your opponent's not going to be able to win out on... They're not going to be able to get a mana advantage on you very often. Their 2 mana removal spell... They're still going to have to pay for, and, and I do think that's a big deal. And there's no spells that get past Ward. No. <laughs> in, in MKM, <laughs> that's right. Ward almost didn't matter part of the time. Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing comparing this to the other play boosters that we had, you know, Karlov Manor recently, was that if you just go to, like, Scryfall and search for each color pair, what do their uncommon gold and mythics look like? Mm -hmm. Each miss on that sheet hurt that pair quite a bit because mm. you see these a little bit more frequently, like you're more likely to open on them. So the fact that you are getting, again, for red, green, two pretty solid uncommons here, and neither of them are misses. I do feel like, you know, we just saw a knife point for red, black. I think that's going to hurt the color pair quite a bit, but I do think that having two cards that both trigger and pay you off for four power at red, green, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to drafting this deck. 
Yeah, if you just look like I, I like to use Simic from Murders as a good example. Where Simic was a good deck, I, not exclusively, but very much propped up by its two good gold uncommons, the uh, the Evidence Examiner and Repulsive Mutation. Those cards were great, and uh, you know, kind of broke the the the, the spell of <laughs> blue green not being so good. So yeah, uh, like you said, I have high hopes for red green as well. What do you want to give this one? Um, I think it's like a C plus ish. Yeah, yeah. I would say so too. Like I said, I was high on it, but like. It sounds like I was going to give it a higher grade, but that's only because if this didn't have Ward 2, I'd be very low on it. Like, I'd give it a, a yeah. D plus or something. So, yeah, I'll join it C plus for Cactus Folk Sure Shot. All right, uh, next up, we've got Green White. We've got Miriam Herd Whisper. This is Green White for a 3 2 human druid. So, not, not an outlaw. As long as it's your turn, mounts and vehicles you control have hexproof. We'll come back to that. Whenever a mount or a vehicle you control attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. So, we know what vehicles are. Mounts are a new kind of theme mechanic here where I wish we, I actually wish I had the foresight to like put one up on the screen here. But basically what they are, are they have this mechanic called saddle and it'll be like saddle. Well, you can just go, you can go to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, let's do want. that. We have, we have one with saddle right here. Perfect, Mark. That, this is why we have you on. So smart. <laughs> so Congregation Griff is a good example. We're not going to read it the full thing here, but it's a, uh, it's a three mana one, four, I guess I am. It's a three mana one, four flying lifelink that uh, has saddle three and saddle three says, Tap any number of other creatures you control with power of three or greater. This mount becomes saddled, so you kind of turn it on. Saddle only to sorcery. And when the griff attacks while it's saddled, it gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of mounts you control. So sort of like vehicles, but you're not, they're always creatures. You're just activating an additional ability on them. And usually it's an attack trigger. Yeah. yeah. And unlike uh, in List or whatever it was in DMU, you can, you can just play a creature and use it just like crew you can use it right away to saddle the creature yep absolutely okay back to miriam here so now that we've kind of looked at uh look at saddle two mana three two again that's that's a good thing i really like two mana three twos uh mounts and vehicles have hex proof on your turn so you can get them into combat and, and your combat tricks are going to work unless they have another combat trick they're of their, their own and whenever a mount or vehicle attacks put a counter on it. that's that's pretty big game too yeah that hex proof ability is really big as well because mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than, you know, you go to combat, oh, yeah. you tapped one creature that that's not going to be able to block to to uh, saddle it, and then you go to combat and they kill your creature or bounce your creature or whatever, and then all of a sudden you've lost two potential attackers slash blockers. Um, so X proof is huge. The ability is good. I think this card's pretty good, and I, I again think that this is a pretty well supported archetype. Yep, me too. Uh, this is very kind of like Vile Smasher-esque, where it's just like, yeah, it's a really good body, and it supports this theme. I'm going to give Miriam a B. A B? Yeah. I will go uh, B minus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now to the card that we already kind of talked about, Congregation Griff. This is one green white for a flying lifelink mount. It's a 1-4. And uh, when it attacks, while well, it's saddled, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of mounts you control. It has saddle three, which is a pretty big number. A lot of these ones are like saddle one, saddle two. Saddle three is a is a reasonable cost. Yes, but on even without the abilities, like a three mana one three flying life linker is not too bad. Mm -hmm. And white and green do have some pretty good combat tricks that can help this. So anytime you're stacking abilities with combat tricks, it just gets exponentially better. Yeah, Flying Lifelink, really nice combination. And uh, this does count itself, by the way. So even if you have no other mounts, you get a little bit of a boost. Yeah, I, I think this card's great. You know, you put a counter on it. I really like this card. Yeah, but like with one other mount, this is hitting for three Lifelink in the air. Yeah. Right? Which is it's a lot of uh, racing potential. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's a it's a real nice curve going Miriam into the Griff. Uh, so do you want to give this, do you like this more or less than Miriam? I think I actually like this better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I I, just, I, like, I love Lifelink. I'm you know. Oh yeah, Lifelink's well, great. Lifelink's Life broken. <laughs> that extends the game. Like, sign me up. You know. Yeah. So you you want to go B on the Griff? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go B for, right. for Griff. Cool, cool. All right, that's gonna bring us to Black White here. Ruthless Lawbringer, first one up. This is one Black White for a three two. It's a assassin, so relevant creature type. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, destroy target non-land permanent. So, Mark, hater of all things sacrifice, what say you about this card? But No, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> this isn't card disadvantage. I know, right? I know, this yeah. Bone splinters. 
Uh, it is unfortunate that it says other, so you can't just use this as like a removal spell, um, which would be nice, mm -hmm. but I, I can understand why they did that. I do think black has a lot of stuff you don't mind sacrificing this. So again, pretty well supported, and I'm I'm actually kind of interested in this. Like it's kind of it's closer to I think it's going to be closer to Skyfisher Spider than Undercity or Undertaker or whatever that called card was from MKM. Yeah, the five mana three three. Yeah, no, no, I agree. And of course, when we get to the monocolor cards, you're going to see black white being supported in this this tokeny theme or the sacrifice theme. There's also the mercenary tokens as things you can sacrifice. So yeah, I'm I'm reasonably happy about this card. And I think Skyfisher Spider is a is a solid comparison. Um, what do you want to give it? I'm going to give it another B+. Plus. Like, I don't think it's insane. I'm kind of grouping these all in the same rough category, mm -hmm. but I do think they've balanced these pairs pretty well. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I think most of the time, you're, you're just going to be happy trading your worst thing for their best thing. Non-land permanent's also a pretty big deal, because there are quite a few good playable, like, we've already seen some, but good playable non-creature cards in this set. Like, it's, it's I think, higher a higher number than usual, even. So, that's a little bit of a bonus, too. Yeah, I'll join you there. I'll join you on the B plus. Uh, we got. Uh, I said B minus. Oh, sorry, B, B minus. My, no, my bad. My bad. Right. B minus. Okay. <laughs> Baron Bertram Greywater. It's a very fancy name. Uh, two white black for a three four vampire noble. So four uh, four mana three four. Whenever one or more tokens enters the battlefield under your control, create a one one black vampire rogue token. That one's relevant with lifelink. This ability triggers only once per turn. It also has an ability, one in a black, sacrifice a creature or an artifact, draw a card. Uh, not interested in this guy. Yeah, same. No, me too. I, I've seen a lot of hype around this card. I'm not interested. What's, uh, what, what got, what has you not interested in it? Like all the same stuff we talked about for, mm -hmm. uh, with the first card in the set. I can't even remember the name at this point. Gem Lightfoot, yeah. But, uh, no, no abilities, no protection, no, you know, not very well statted. And the ability isn't even, like, guaranteed to do anything. Right. Like, you, you might not have something that makes a token. Or if, or if it does, it might cost less than four. And then, like, are you going to hold it? Or are you going to do it later? And the ability to sack, it doesn't even sack itself. There's just a lot of things that kind of don't add up on this for me. Yeah, I've seen a comparison to, like, Skullport Merchant. So for people who don't remember that one, that's the one th three mana one four comes in with the treasure. With this ability, sacrifice a creature or an artifact, draw a card. Much, much different, because this does not spot you that treasure. Um, that's that's like a world of difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly... I think this card reads very... It looks very exciting, looks, reads very well. I think in practice, it just isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to play out the way you want it to. So I'm, I'm going to give Baron a D. Yeah, I was going to go D as well. I, I, uh... And it might sound like a hot take to some people. I, I think, I think uh, you know, a lot of dreamers out there. But a lot of times, this thing's just not going to survive, and you're going to be sad about it. All right, Honest Rustine, green black going on here. One black green for a 3 2 human warlock, another outlaw. When it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. And creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. That's the, that is, by the way, that is the worst line for a podcast or content creator. It's just like, it's so hard to say. Creatures, spells you cast cost one less to cast. But, anyways, <laughs> so it's like an eternal witness or gravedigger, I should say. Three mana gravedigger comes in and makes your creatures cheaper. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that typically with Grave Diggers, you want to hold them as long as possible to get back your five or six drop. But then, like, the second ability isn't going to be as relevant. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of asking to be played mid game. Uh, but that's pretty good stats on a, on a value creature. Like, yeah, I think this card's pretty good. Yeah, I, I really like this card. There's going to be some times where you have hand a hand that you've just played on three. I think it's going to be pretty, you know, not, not that common, but look for the times you do. Um, you know, some actually, I take it back. I think a lot of the time you're just gonna like play it too. They're gonna play it too. You're gonna go sure trade, play this on three. You get your two back, and then you they are very priced into killing this thing if they ha if they have a removal spell because if they don't, you get to double spell pretty nicely next turn. Yeah, yeah. Like even as long as you're getting something back, yeah. Like even a one drop, right? Yeah. Like I don't want to play it on three just as a mana dork. Although I'm sure that'll happen at least once in the format. But as long as you're getting something back, this card's just great. Yeah. I really like this one. And uh, there is a little bit of self mill going on too. So sometimes even if creatures didn't trade off, you get to get something back. This one I want to give even higher. Like, is B plus too high? Do you think that's a little too hot? Or I was going between B and B plus. So yeah. if you're going to be brave, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. 
I also think it's like fairly splashable too. Like you know, when you're, we're gonna get this into uh, when we get to the lands, but I think it's a pretty splashing friendly set. So I'm I'm gonna give the you know maybe slightly hot take a B plus, but I, I really like Honest Rest Team. Sure. Yeah. All right, Badlands Revival is up next. This is a three black green sorcery. Return up to one target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Return up to one target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So worded that way so you can you know you don't have to have one in your graveyard like two things in your graveyard you could just do one if you wanted to uh but yeah it's cool reanimate something bring something back still a bit expensive but yeah i am not as into this mm -hmm. yeah uh, is this card? i don't know why but is this card a, a reprint no i don't think so okay i don't know why I, I felt there was something like this before but uh yeah like you're not casting it on turn five you're only going to maybe feel good about that if your three drop and four drop have traded. And then, so it's, it's really like a super late game card mm -hmm. and just any of these cards that have an ability without stats, when you compare them to ability that does have stats, I just, you got to sign up for the stats all the time. Yeah. Power, power tough just matters so much. Like it's, it's really truly, it truly does. <sighs> I mean, <laughs> in the games that are going long and are about value, it's a really good value card, but... Yeah, yeah. I was still... I was thinking, like... I'll go first on this one. I was thinking, like, C-minus yeah. type of thing. I, I was going to give it a C. I, mean, I, I think that, like, Black Green kind of looks that up enough to be able to have stuff in its graveyard. Like, I, I think you're going to cast this on turn five some amount of the time. Um, and that's not... It's not uh, going to be too common, but that's part of the range here. I'm not high on that, but, yeah. See, so I'm going to land on the C. You're going to give it a C-minus? Yeah. All right, cool. Blue green. Let's see if blue green can have a repeat performance with two sicko uncommons here. So we've got Doc Orlock, Grizzled Genius. This is blue green for a 2 3, not 3 2, like some of the other ones, a 2 3. It's a bear druid legendary creature. Spells you cast from your graveyard or from exile cost two less to cast. And it says plotting cards from your hand cost two less. So again, we haven't seen a plot card just yet. But just to give a quick preview, if, if you haven't seen a plot card before, what plot says is you can pay the card's plot cost, exile it from your hand, and then cast it for free on a future turn at sorcery speed. And sometimes the plot cost is different for the mana cost, but, you know, if we're just talking about this card here, you can kind of imagine it as just casting a creature. And casting a creature for two less, like a two mana less discount, that, that's a huge discount. It's, I mean, this thing, if you play it turn three or four and immediately plot something, then you basically spend zero mana on this. Yeah. The um, the spells you cast from your graveyard in exile, that's kind of like a constructed line of text. There's not too much that actually matters for that here. You're really just looking at the plotting cards from your hand cost two less. So you want to have a lot of plot cards. I think that's, that's pretty clear to, to make this card tick. Uh, you want to have one in your opening hand. Ideally two, because if you can have this on two, plot two things on three or maybe maybe not on three. well sometimes you're going to be able to plot two things on three but the big turn is on four i think if you have two plot cards you're almost certainly going to be able to plot both of them and you have an explosive turn on the turn after <sighs> yeah i it, it's a lot it's a lot of good stuff yeah the, it's not an insane top deck but it's still like pretty well statted mm -hmm. like, even if you don't have a ton of plot cards i think you're still gonna play this because yeah two three for two is is just fine. decent stat yeah you're not sad about it yeah this is i, I almost want to give this like a build around like synergy ish grade because it definitely scales a lot right it just the more plot you have in your deck because i think you really are looking for that double plot turn early on if you can do that you pull way ahead in the game and if you don't this card's like whatever it's like a c minus <sighs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy if I cast this and get a single discount of two. Sure, I guess, yeah. You know, I you guess like... I'm being a bit narrow with this. You're right. Because if you plot something and then cast another spell, you're totally right about that. I, I, I'm, I'm harping too much on that. Because if you just cast, yeah, you're still able to double spell nicely even with one plot card. Like the, the scenario you're talking about is when your two drop literally just like wins you the game. Yeah. <laughs> not the bar you need to set it. Well, that's at, great. Right? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's great though. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, what do you want to give? I guess you, you gave your grade last time. I, I'm going to start... I, I do think I'm going to give this a bit of a synergy grade. Um, and you're, you're looking for somewhere between five, six, seven plot cards if you can. Can you give it like a synergy B? It's going to definitely have a range though. Okay, I, I like I don't 
think a synergy grade is needed for this because again i think you're just going to cast it and mm. you just kind of grade it on what the average case is sure. based on what blue green decks look like yeah um but i'll yeah i'll just give it uh i'm gonna go another b minus i think okay. it's another good card and and, it, and again it could be a lot higher if your deck's got 10 plot cards it's probably gonna be insane yeah but i think the average <laughs> case is about a b minus yeah totally uh we've got make your own luck this is three blue green for sorcery look at the top three cards of your library you may exile a non-land card from among them. If you do, it becomes plotted. Put the rest into your hand. So you get to draw three, but one of them is plotted. So you get to cast it for free next turn or in a future turn. Yeah, I saw a lot of people during uh, spoilers in, in your Discord not realize that this is just a draw three with yeah. upside. Yeah, really yeah. nice. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I think it's easy to read this as like, oh, look at the top three, cast one of them later. No, 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 no. This is three cards worth of card advantage and a bunch of mana too. Yeah. And I think this card, like the, the thing you want after drawing a bunch of cards is to catch back up on tempo. Exactly. And this, it's not guaranteed. If you get three lands, I mean, you're not plotting anything, mm -hmm. but this is really good at doing that. Yeah. It's not a card. You're just going to jam like as many copies as you can into your deck, but it's a really good top end card. So yeah, it's much better than a, your average draw three. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I like this card a lot. I'm going to give it just like a straight B. Yeah, no, me too. I, I think this one has high, but like, even if you just hit a two drop, I mean, it's not going to be that co common that just you look at top three, the best thing you have is a two drop. But I think you're not that sad about that. So yeah, I'll join you on B for make your own luck. Uh, actually, one little thing I, I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know what? Never mind. I'll, I'll, get, I'll talk about it when we get to the end of the gold cards here. Uh, blue, red is up next. Slick sequence. So this is a instant that says deals two damage to any target. And if you've cast another spell this turn, you draw a card. What a, what a cool card. So this is Blue-Red's theme. It wants you to cast your second spell in a turn, and then you'll get some sort of bonus on the payoffs. Yeah, and so the ways to turn that on that they've seeded, there's cheap uh, cantrips, draw spells, but mm -hmm. then, of course, the plot mechanic as well. Uh, if you plot something, you're not casting a spell when you plot it, but then on a later turn when you cast it from exile, that's uh, a zero-mana way to add to your spell count, so it's going to be really easy to turn it on with plot cards. Yeah, and, and the payoff here is good. Like, a uh, cantripping draw, too. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and, like, you know, even if you just, like, hit the face, I'm, I'm not going to hit the face that often, but there's going to be a lot of games where you're setting up the math and being like, okay, well, they're 11. I can, like, push mm, seven damage on the ground. Maybe this goes to face, draws me into something else. Like, you know, you're going to set up those situations a lot. Yeah, I... I uh, I'm in love with this card, just just like the aesthetics of it. I don't want to give it too high of a grade based on that, but I also think it's a good card. Um, I'm gonna give Slick Sequence a B minus. B minus? Yeah. I was gonna. I I guess I'm a lot higher. I wrote down B plus. For oh, myself. really? Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm I'm just imagining that sometime like you're not always gonna get have your cake and eat it too. And when I say not always, I mean like I think there's gonna be a substantial amount of the time where the thing that like your shock isn't going to. Ah, you know what? I'm I was gonna go on a tangent somewhere, but it's too niche. it's too niche don't even worry about it we don't need to waste all the time we have a lot of cards to talk about today i'll, I'll still well, think it might be so there is yeah. a lot of like two twos at uh, two yeah. mana and there's actually a lot of three twos and four twos for the four power deck right so i think like this hits a good chunk of three drops i think mm -hmm. and i've already uh, seen some yeah and, and i don't think it's that hard to turn on so uh, yeah i think this is going to be a real like grown test when it gets cast by your opponent all right, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, uh, I'll come up with on to be on with you because I love the card so much. <laughs> uh, Chrom, Violent Cacophony, up next. This is three blue red for a two three flyer. It's a zombie horror, legendary creature. Whenever you cast your second spell, each turn you put a plus one plus one counter on Chrom, and you draw a card. Ooh. Yeah. So this card had me look through for. This is kind of how I noticed that all the, you know, the plots, the outlaws and everything were spread across multiple colors. Because it's not just blue-red that do plotting. And blue and red, actually, a lot of their plots plot for four mana. So you mm. really, like, the ideal curve is plot something on three, and then turn four, you cast Chrom, and then cast your second spell. Because you do need to cast your, your Chrom before the second spell, otherwise that trigger won't resolve if, if this is the spell you've cast. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So yep. I do think there's some awkwardness here, even though the ability is, like, very powerful. Yeah, one thing that's nice, and, and just, I, I think with, with the plot mechanic, which we're going to get into, of course, a little more, we see some more plot cards, but they, they've used it 
like design wise, they've implemented it in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways that make you want to plot. And one of the cool things is on a card like Krom here, where, you know, we've been talking about this whole time, like your four mana creatures have to have immediate impact or give you an ETB. Well, if you do play this and cast one of your plot cards, there's actually no window for your opponent to disrupt it. So you're going to get your card if you have something plotted. Right, so that's yes. kind of a way to make up for this isn't an ETB creature, doesn't have a protection ability or anything. Yeah, I th I think this one's going to very much, like you're, you're leading on here, it's going to very much depend on the play patterns of the way you're playing your cards. And I, I mean, you know, I'm willing to be optimistic and trust their designs that there are good play patterns with this card. I think we've are, we, if you look through the set, there, there are clear ones that uh, you can point out. So yeah, I, I think this card's pretty good. It's going to be tough to grade because, again, I think it's pretty hard to trigger this on turn four. Right, yeah. If you do, it's great. But if you don't, it's, uh, you know, Mirkwood Bats or whatever. You know? <laughs> four mana, two, three flying. Not exactly what you want to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, def another card with a pretty large range here. So, as as we do with cards ranges, we kind of average it out. You want to give yeah. Chroma a C plus? I was going to go C. Okay. Yeah. I'll, you're going C plus? Yeah, I'll go C plus with, with the off. Right. You know, it sounds like sometimes you're higher on cards, sometimes I'm lower on cards. And when we start these set reviews, it sounds like I'm I'm a little higher starting off here with these, but yeah, I see the vision. <laughs> I see the vision and I think I think they're like the thing is too, if you this does stick, like I've been talking about, oh, if they have a removal spell. If this does stick, you get your trigger. Anything that cares about double like double spelling or you know, do a thing, draw a card. You're gonna keep doing it because if it goes in check one time, it's more more likely to stick around, and you're drawing more cards to draw into more things to trigger it. So that's part of the range too. So I got I gotta give it a little bit of a bump for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it snowballs really well. Yeah. That's that's definitely something to mention. Red white up next. Form a posse. This is X red white for sorcery. Create X one one mercenary tokens. Uh, with I'll read it again just for folks who uh, are not quite acquainted with these yet. They're the tap target creature you control gets plus one plus one until on a turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So X, red, white. So at four mana, you're getting two of them. Five mana, getting three, so on and so on. It's not a lot of immediate impact, but it does set you up really well for the game going on. Is that something that red, white wants a ton of? I don't know. Yeah, I... I think this set is less red white smash face mm -hmm. than a lot of recent sets. Right. Um, like white in particular, when we'll get to it, it doesn't look like a very aggressive color. So this card on its own, I don't think you're gonna play this just for the text. But if you're, you know, doing something with those, either those tokens or the creature type or the power or the spell type, there's a lot of ways that this can be a little bit more than what it reads and i i do think that there's going to be times that you'll be pretty happy with this yeah if you kind of frame this less as a red white aggro card and just like a good mid-range card you start to think about it scaling to like because like you know i i started at like four and three mana but maybe you splash this in a green deck and you do like x equals six or something you stabilize the board incredibly well and you can attack very well as the game goes on because you're like, all right, send in my 6-1 or whatever, <laughs> you know, every single turn. And, you know, obviously it's going to get a little bit, uh, as you're sending your mercenaries, it's, they're going to diminish their pumps. But you can pump your other things too. And, and one thing I wanted to bring up, we, we talked about the mercenaries being able to block. That was actually interestingly here for people in, in, uh, interested in this kind of stuff. Dave Humphreys, who designed the set, mentioned that they, they didn't block at one point, but he purposely made them block because he heard the, the hubbub everybody's been talking about about limited formats being too fast. So that's a, an intentional design choice these can block. So that's I love to hear stories like that. Yeah. The system works. You complain <laughs> enough and it works. Yeah, the system <laughs> works, baby. Oh, yeah. Tough, tough, uh, tough card to grade without just like seeing a, a red white deck just laid out in front of you. Because I think if you're an aggressive deck, this card's not that good. You, you just don't, it's just too much mana for not enough output. But yeah, if you're a little like, bit mid-rangey. This pops off with like a Vile Smasher. Oh, like just, yeah, yeah. Like X, X to the face. So just, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can get more than uh, more than what you see here. I, I'm still going to go pretty low on this. I'm going to give it like a D plus. Okay, I, w I was going to give it a C minus. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, I, I think... Yeah, I, I now that I've, I've talked about it, I'm just imagining like the big X. <laughs> the big, like, it's like a bunch of man into it. Less so the... All right, this props up my 
play a, play a two, play a three, and start attacking. So for that reason, I'm going to land in the C range. But the, the other thing, too, is I think as we've been talking about these, I'm just thinking more and more, maybe these mercenary, like we said we like these mercenary tokens, but maybe they're even a bit better than they seem, um, just the way things are costed. Uh, but yeah, I, I talked about there being um, like lifelink in this set. Like there's there's a good amount of lifelink. These things love creatures with lifelink. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great. Yeah, yeah. Any keywords makes makes any pumping better. All right, we've got Eartha Joe, Frontier Mentor here as the second golden common here from Boros. Two red white for a two four. It's a core advisor, legendary creature. When it enters the battlefield, you make a mercenary token, and whenever you activate an ability that targets a creature or a player. Copy that ability. You can choose new targets for the copy. Yeah, it's abilities only. So very important to note, mm -hmm. it's only abilities. But of course, the mercenaries are abilities. So you're already doubling all your mercenary triggers. And the fact that you can like redistribute them, this card is yeah. pretty terrifying. As well. like it's it's good on value and it's good on stats and tempo. This this kind of ticks all the boxes. This card's great. Yeah, this card is really fantastic. It's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, for the listeners out there and for us, of course, too. Just like as we go through this set, just remember, okay, what's an activated ability that targets? Because doubling that's pretty sweet. And and yeah, just I think what you said is really important here. The baseline's great. Just a two four that comes with a one one, you're very very happy with that. A one one mercenary token too. That's that's really strong. Yeah, I want to give this a B plus. Yeah, that's where I'm. Yeah, yeah, nice B plus for Earthage. The last last golden common gets a really high grade. All right, moving on to artifacts just before we go into artifacts i did want to say that one little thing um about the golden commons so a question i get pretty frequently is how many legends is are too many legends and half of those golden commons like one co uncommon for each color pair was a gold it was a legendary creature and there's some apprehension about like oh like I, i'm gonna be stuck with them in my hand a lot of those were cheap legends though and cheap legends are a lot more tenable to put in your deck multiple copies of because they just trade off or your opponent kills them right so Maybe four or five might be a little bit excessive, but you shouldn't be afraid to play the first two or three copies. Like, that's that's usually pretty okay. Um, anyways, Gold Pan is our first artifact here. What's, uh, what's this one do? This is an equipment. So two mana for an equipment. Equips for one mana. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. And when Gold Pan enters the battlefield, you create a treasure token. Hmm. Okay. So, like... Uh, it's just a very medium equipment, I guess. It's not that exciting. Yeah, it's certainly no gold vein pick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do think it has a place mm -hmm. for some, like, it is fixing. Sure, yeah. That's <laughs> kind of. Categorically but, fixing, uh, yes. <laughs> there's also, you know, the, uh, the, the four or greater power deck. Uh-huh. I think there could be spots where this shines in that yeah i i also agree i think there are going to be niche spots for this that will become apparent as we play the set more um without being time traveling supercomputers it's hard to really nail that down exactly it's it's not a great card on baseline let's let's put it that way so just like average yeah, i'm gonna give it like a d okay yeah yeah i'm i'm with you d is d is perfect for this card just there's there's not a d minus not lower than that there's gonna be spots for no. it though yeah, okay. yeah. D is like, you know, once or twice a set, I'll put this in my deck and I'll be happy with it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this next one's pretty cool. Cool little variant on a card we see quite often. Silver Deputy. Two mana for an artifact creature mercenary. It's a 1-2. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card or a desert card. Reveal it, shuffle, uh, and put it on, on your top of your library. And then it has the mercenary ability of tapping to pump something. So two mana, 1-2. That goes and gets a land, kind of like you know your camp campus guide or all, all your cards like that, and uh, has that mercenary pump. Yeah. So typically, when they've put cards like this in a set, I've played them a good amount because the fixing's been kind of bad. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of like one of the only options to do fixing. This set, we'll see as we kind of go through. That is not the case. Nope. Totally so right. I actually think that this card is only good if you want to fix and i don't think you are going to need it basically ever yeah and i also think there's like a slight i mean it's not like it's it's a nothing ability but your decks that are looking to splash are a little bit less interested in attacking they're less still interested in getting attack and the pump ability is not nothing but um the the card the, the abilities are not they don't just go hand in hand like chocolate and peanut butter you know so yeah what do you want to give this one uh, like I kind of want to give it a D minus. I play a lot of split splashing, so I'm probably gonna 
give it a personal grade of D because mm -hmm. I do expect I'll play at least one of these per set, but somewhere in the D to D minus range, no better than that. Yeah, I'm just going to give it a D. Let's leave it at that. Uh, Oasis Gardener up next. Three mana for an artifact creature, Scarecrow. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It says when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life and it taps to add a mana of any color. Yeah, so already slightly better way of fixing. Not a lot better, but slightly better. Slightly better, yeah. It's uh, That two life does really matter. If this didn't have that two life gain, I'd be totally out on it because you know, it's understated and you're just, you don't want to block with these kind of cards when they come down. But that little, tiny little buffer, that, that matters. That, that makes it a little more acceptable to play this kind of card on three. Yeah, it doesn't move it out of the D range, but this one gets a D plus yep, for me. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to land too. Sweet. Sterling Hound. This is a three mana, three, two. And it's an artifact creature dog. <laughs> Comes in, surveil two. Yeah, we've seen cards similar to this before. Sometimes they surveil one, sometimes they surveil two. It's somewhat filler. Another kind of D plus card for me. Yeah, yeah, I was going to get a D plus two. And I just want to call out the uh, the very ham-fisted flavor text here. I was right on, seen on a pro, uh, courthouse sign. Beware of Cog. Because it's like a mechanical dog. Anyways, <laughs> D plus for Sterling Hound. Lava Spur Boots. This is interesting. I've seen some uh, some debate about this one. Lava Spur Boots is a single mana equipment. It's an uncommon here. Single mana to play, single mana to equip. The equipped creature gets plus one, plus O, oh, and has haste and ward one. I'm super low on this. Yeah, I'm super low on it too. I don't know. I, I just seen some hype right. of... I, I think because it's a very cheap equipment, both to play and equip, and it has like some upside here and there, but it's pretty marginal upside. You, you don't like the advantage of haste is kind of diminished a little bit by having to pay additional mana. Cause you're paying like you're doing your one turn later. <laughs> like after yeah. the, the game goes on. Sure. Yeah. You're top decking, but this is not going to be a great card in your opening hand for your aggro decks. No. And it's not a very good top deck either. No, exactly. Uh, just, yeah, I, I, I think I'm just gonna give this a D minus. Maybe yeah, even an D F minus is where I am as well. Yeah. All right, I'm curious to see what you think about this one. Boombox. Two mana for an artifact at Uncommon. These are all Uncommons, by the way, now. We're, we're going to the Uncommons. Six, tap it. Sacrifice Boombox. Destroy up to one target artifact, one target creature, and one target land. You're asking me because I, I keep finding ways to play these crappy-looking artifacts. Oh. I, like, I you know, we had uh, Goblin Firebomb <laughs> and Brothers War. We had Urn of the Godfire and, and March of the Machines. And both of those I played way more than I thought I was going to. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and this card kind of has hints of that a little bit. Yeah, but it's still bad, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I... So when this was previewed, uh, I, I kind of commented in my Discord. I was like, I think this card is not just stone unplayable. I think there are decks that just have enough mana production that are not going to hate this. But yeah, I, I will... I've said it a lot on it being a D minus two. Not quite an F, but low tier removal spell in your decks that make a lot of mana. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a. I really wish that this hit uh, an enchantment because there's a, quite mm. a chunk of those. Yeah, totally. I think it'd be a lot sweeter. Like, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna give it. I'll give it a D, and you're gonna go D minus. Yep, yep. I'm I'm in for that. Mobile Homestead. We got a vehicle here. It says two mana for a three three vehicle. Uh, uncommon once again. It has haste as long as you control a mount. And it says when Mobile Homestead attacks, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. Crew, two. Yeah, so kind of just a slightly smaller version of another uh, Dave Humphreys special. Yeah. Which is from um, Kaldheim. And that card was better than it looked. And I so I think people are going to be better at evaluating this from from the get-go although i guess that set was like what like <laughs> three four years ago yeah, at this point it's been a while it's it's, it's been quite a while but uh yeah it's th this kind of effect because you don't see it that often the look of the top card if it's a land put it on the battlefield it's pretty good uh you like you just you know to put it bluntly you flood a little bit less often you get more man to play you can double spell like that that's a really nice thing to be able to just like crew it hit a land if you get lucky on an early turn you get you just hell, hell you just cast a free rampant growth essentially um yeah it, it's a little bit you know two mana crew two as a three three a little bit small but i think it's still gonna be pretty good yeah i have this as probably like a c plus type of thing yeah i was gonna give it a c but yeah i agree with that same same range tomb trawler here is it tomb trawler yes it's tomb uh this is two mana for a 04 artifact and it says, has the ability to 
put target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Yeah, so things that are just big butts are a little punished by the fact that there's mercenaries in this set. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not really holding off attacks. So I like that they continue to include these because there's often some brewer who's usually named Sam Black who will do something interesting <laughs> with them. And I enjoy watching those, but not not for me. I'll probably never play this card. Yeah, he, he uh, usually goes by Sam Black because I only know any other... Sam's the only other person I know who does this. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I agree. It, it's a card. It almost feels like they designed these cards exclusively for Sam and people who want to emulate what Sam does at this point. <laughs> They're just like, oh. I mean, he did he did work on designing a few sets. Maybe he like hacked into one of the computers and like <laughs> there's a recurring pop-up every yeah. time a new set goes. <laughs> he programmed it. Yeah, I'm gonna, gonna join you at the same grade there for this uh, kind of oddball card. Is it a D minus or an F? I, I was gonna give it a D minus, yeah. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll join you there. It would be interesting if you could target your opponent's stuff. A little more interesting, because then you, like, commit a crime. But that, that might be a little bit too good, to be honest. Just repeatable. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. It would be a lot better. Yeah. But, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of room to make it a lot better. Yeah, totally. Uh, Bandit's Hall up next. Three mana for an artifact. Whenever you commit a crime, put a loot counter on Bandit's Hall. This ability triggers only once each turn. Tap. Add one mana of any color. Two tap. Remove two loot counters from Bandit's Hall. Draw a card. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of the um, Strixhaven Satchel. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like yeah, yeah. Spell Satchel, something like that, where it was two mana and you had to play spells to put counters on it and you can either tap it for mana or draw cards. I think that's what it was called. Yeah, Spell Satchel. Yeah, something like that. And it was it was a lot better than it looked because it looked like an F and then it didn't play out like that at all. Yeah, totally. I'm kind of into this It costs card. three, which is a lot more than two, but uh, it does spot you the mana basically for free. Yeah, I'm sort of into this card. Like, the downside of a mana lith, besides costing three mana, <laughs> is that it kind of just, it, you know, you're, you're, you don't get your card back. There's just a mana source in your deck. But this one does. And as we mentioned, committing a crime is, you know, going to happen fairly often. Like, I'm not trying to say it's a great card or anything, but a lot of times these mana lith cards are just pretty much close to unplayable. And I don't think this one is. Yeah, I was still not going to give this a very high grade. Because I do think it's just worse than the Intimidation campaign, ki like kind of doing the, the similar type of thing. Yep. Um, but like uh, D plus. Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna do the exact same grade. D plus for Bandit's all. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we got Rock Red Sentinel here. It's three mana for a two four Golem artifact creature. It's got Defender, and it has two tap, sack a land, draw a card, and create a treasure token. Yeah, uh, Red Rock. I think you said Rock Red. Oh, is it Rock Red? Oh, sorry about that. Red Rock. Okay. That, it makes a lot fine. more sense. <laughs> yeah. And I am not interested in this one pretty much at all. Yeah, I don't think so either. I I do wonder if there's like some sort of engines you can set up where you're like creating a treasure token each turn and you can use that. Like I, I have my, you know, my, sen my spidey senses of there's something you can do with this are going off. Not generically good, but, you know, keep, keep it. There, there's a, a little bit of Johnny in me that's kind of Look, has my eye open for something, so we'll see. But I agree, not generically good. I was going to give this a D minus. Are yeah. you going any higher than that? No, I'll go D minus as well too. Okay. All right, what do we have next? Next is Luxurious Locomotive, five mana for a vehicle. It crews for one, but you can only crew it once each turn. It is a six-five, and when it attacks, create a treasure token for each creature that crewed it this turn. Right. What? Uh... Why do they have that restriction on there? Because you can crew, like, you can overcrew well, the first time you do it. Yeah, you can overcrew it, but you can't then add more creatures after they've declared no blocks. Sure, sure. Yeah, that I makes sense. I think that's why. So, yeah. Which I, I'm guessing that's some kind of constructed text where, yeah, like, you know. But it's on a I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's weird. It doesn't seem like a really big deal if you're tapping more creatures for more treasures, whether it's before or after to me, but I'm sure there was a reason. They did. Yeah, I'm sure it prevents some like infinite combo or something like that or something undesirable. So five mana, crew one, six, five. And so you're not actually getting that much of a benefit from the crewing. Like you're getting one point of power and you make a treasure token. This does not seem very good to me. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. It's not a damage target. It's an attack target. Yeah, it's an attack target. So sorry, that's, that's what I was saying, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm not even right about that. So who who knows why it has that <laughs> crew only once? But uh, it makes it easier on Arena. There's less stops to worry that's, about. That actually, yeah, that's probably something. 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I am into this card. I don't hate it, but yeah, it's not very good. Yeah, you want to give it like, like, <laughs> so like, I'm going to guess your grades after saying not going to, you don't hate it. I'm going to guess you're going to give it a D. Yeah, somewhere between D and D plus. Okay, yeah, I, I was going to give it a D too. And like, the my kind of like, oh, I don't like this card. It comes from the fact that it's like an uncommon, which, you know, you expect a little bit more. And I don't think this is giving you that much more. So I was just going to give it a D. Okay, I'll go, I'll go D plus just to be a little bit more optimistic. Okay, sounds good. All right, it's going to bring us to quite a few lands. And the, the first grouping of lands we have here, Cycle of Tapped Deserts. That add one mana of either two colors. So we got dual lands here. For example, uh, Lonely... Ooh, Ar Arroyo? I don't know that word, actually. I've never seen it before. And enters the battlefield tapped, and it adds blue or white. But it also, when it enters, you deal one damage to target opponent. So you get to commit a crime with your land drop. Yeah, so when the set was first spoiled, I was worried because I saw a lot of huge creatures. I saw a lot of abilities that kind of didn't want you to play defense and then i saw these lands that basically you functionally are going to start some games at like 17 or 18 life yeah um but these lands are not going to be in the common slot of the boosters is my understanding you'll right. only see these in the land slot correct that's correct yep okay so yeah, you're going to see what uh, you're going to see half of them so 18 uh sorry no 12 yeah i can't do math here 12 12 of these lands per draft. So a little over one of each. Yeah. That's like pretty similar to a lot of sets we've seen recently where they've kind of impl impl implemented this kind of stuff. Um, I think these are going to be pretty high picks. I yes. think, yeah, like the fact that they're scarce, the fact that they are a not quite free committing a crime because it costs you a mana essentially, but also a desert. And there are cards that care about that scattered throughout the set. There are, it also is just like dual land, which is something that is valuable. Yeah, I usually we give these a C plus, just blanket across the board. These dual lands are common; they're a C plus. Do you think this gets into the B minus range? I think so. Yeah, I, I was hoping you say yes. <laughs> reasonably happy, like first picking these from a week back. Yeah, which that's kind of what a B minus is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's actually a really good way to frame. You're like not sad to first pick it out of week back. All right, well, um, we don't have to read all of these because they essentially are all the same, but worth noting, there, there are 10 of them. And we'll, you know, just nicely go through the art here. They do have nice art. Brings us to another desert, and I think there's like five or six other deserts in the set. Conduit Pylons is our first one. This is a common, and it ETBs, Surveil 1. Ah, yeah, this is this is a Mark favorite. Enter the battlefield, Surveil 1, tap to add colorless, one tap, add a mana of any color. Yeah, I've seen a few people post their, like, 17 land tier list of commons and uncommons, mm -hmm. and I still haven't seen anyone respect this card nearly the amount that I plan to. Yeah, yeah, and, and when Mark says he respects it, uh, he's going to put five of them in his deck if he can help it. <laughs> but, but, but... No, 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 I learned my lesson. Four was too many, okay? Four... but two for sure, and three maybe in some crazy cases. Yeah, so, I mean, talk this card up just quickly for people who maybe don't have it on the radar, who maybe in the sets we've seen this kind of card in recently it didn't take it as highly as, as, a, as a Mark player might. Um, so curving out is always going to be extremely important, but having the mana to cast your spells to me is even more important, yeah. and I'm someone who likes to splash a lot. So... It's never going to, like, most decks are going to be two-color decks. So let's say you're playing white-blue, right? And your opening hand is two planes and this. Mm -hmm. Well, you can cast your white spells on curve, so you're probably not going to fall, like, super far behind. And you can cast your blue spells behind curve, which is a lot better than not casting them at all. So you that's the, the problem. I did draft a deck in, uh, in um, DMU that had four grottos and then when you draw nothing but grottos and you don't even hit your, one of your colors <laughs> it certainly becomes a problem yeah but the first one of these i would love in every deck it's a desert so it's got types and surveil one is even better than scry one because there are quite a number of um things that reanimate or care about your graveyard so this card is going to be pretty good for me and just like it's all five colors of mana so if you want to splash a powerful rare that you open Here's plus one source without having to add a basic of that type to your deck. Yeah. I mean, you, you said it all. I don't really have anything to add to that. 
Uh, other than the grade you want to stamp on it, I'm going to give it a C plus because I think you're going to take it speculatively pretty, pretty uh, fairly often. I think your decks that are splashing are just going to want to copy. Does it go into B minus for Mark? Uh, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll just, just to reflect how much sure. I enjoy it, I'll give it a B minus. Yeah, no, no, I like it, I like it. Gotta stay true to yourself. All right, we got Mirage Mesa up next. This is a familiar card. It's a desert. Enters the battlefield tapped. You choose a color, and it adds a color of the chosen color. Or mana of the chosen yeah. color, sorry. Yeah, so another way of counting is all color sources. And again, it's better than Evolving Wilds in that you don't have to add all the various basics of the off colors that you want. Yep. Another just really good land, another half land I'm going to be happy to pick. And I think, um, does this one make it into the B range? This is probably the best out of all of them, right? Yeah, I would put this in the B range, like B minus. I, I think these cards are, they they are always pretty good and, and fairly high picks. Okay. I do think that you're going to like these more than the dual lands mm. in pack one. Oh, I see. But then in pack, you know, two when you kind of know what colors you are you'd probably rather have the dual land so yeah same grade seems fair yeah absolutely all right sweet we've got oh a very interesting one here arid archway this one's an uncommon and the rest of them are going to be as well it's a desert of course and enters the battlefield tapped and it says when arid archway enters the battlefield return a land you control to its owner's hand if you if another desert was returned this way you surveil one and it taps to add colorless colorless so it's a soul land it adds two mana but your mana neutral because you have to pick up a land, but you haven't played with these kind of cards before. These kind of caroos or bounce lands, they are card advantage, right? Because if you imagine an opening hand with this and let's just say one other land or just two other lands, let's say, you know, two of your colors, you've got white, blue in this, and you've got a four drop in hand, you don't have to worry about, ooh, am I going to draw that, that land to hit my four drop on time? You've already got that fourth mana source in hand. And it doesn't seem like card advantage, but, but it really is. Colorless is a big downside, though. <laughs> yeah, so how do we weigh that? I love this thing, partly because there's so many ways to search it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So if you ever have a land that, you know, a, a card that searches for a land and puts it into play, like drawing basically two lands off that card instead when your mana's already pretty good, is having this like as kind of like a toolbox land in your deck is going to feel so good sometimes. Yeah, and you can you can pick up your other surveil land and then surveil with this. You get so much surveilling, Mark. You, get, <laughs> you just get. I'm going to be doing a lot of surveil. Yeah, yes. yeah. So what do you want to give it? I want to give this a B. I just think it's good. Oh, wow, that high. Yeah, I, I was going to go B minus, but I mean, it's not like it's a giant different or, difference or anything. But yeah, no, no, I uh, I agree. I think I think colorless lands really just want to hammer that point home. It's a big cost. It's a really big cost. But card advantage is also great. So I'll, I'll stick with my B minus and we'll go to the next one. Sandstorm Verge. This is a, another desert once again. It taps the add colorless and it says three tap target creature can't block this turn. Activate only as a sorcery. Yeah. So this one's a lot worse because mm -hmm. instead of adding sources, you're, you're, I mean, the last one was also colorless. It didn't add any sources, but card advantage goes a long way to fixing that. But there certainly is a cost to adding lands that don't tap for either of your primary colors. And I think I talked about the benefits of searching up the last one. I do think that still applies here. The exception is that the only time I want this is when I've got a deck that's good at searching it up in the late game. Yeah, when I first read this, I thought it said target creature can't be blocked. I was like, oh, that's, that's actually pretty good for that cost. Um, much worse. Hmm. But yeah, I, like I think... I think or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think exactly what you said. If you have a way to search this up and just kind of toolbox it out, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in it, but it's not just the card you're going to throw in any deck. And I think you I also... Mean, it does... Is that... Yeah, go ahead. It does commit crimes every turn. Sure, every... sure. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. I didn't actually think about that. Hmm. Hmm. Still not that high on it, though, but... No, no. Yeah. I was going to give it like, uh, like a D. Yeah, I was going to go D plus. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, our last land here is Bucolic Ranch. This is, once again, a desert. Taps to add colorless. Taps to add, or taps to add one mana of any color. Spend this mana only to cast a mount. Also has the ability, three tap. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a mount card, you can put it in your hand or reveal it. If you don't put it into your hand, you can put it on the bottom of your library. Yeah, so I don't think people realize how many mounts you need to, for this to be 
played in a deck, so it's probably going to have pretty bad uh, stats on 17 lands. Yep. It's the, it's the Cavern of Souls problem, where people just go like, oh, I've got, a, like, four of those creature types, right? Like, I can throw it in my deck, and those can't be countered. But you really have to have, like, what, eight, nine of your cards that this taps for? And uh, that's, that's, like, not that easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, eight's kind of the, the number I'm thinking of as well. There's not a ton of mounts in the set. If you do have eight mounts, this card's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So give it like a synergy C plus. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good grade. Chat saying like, well, at very least it's a tap three scry land basically, and like that is true. I, I don't want to knock that, but again, colorless. That's that's a really big deal. Okay, so Mark as he usually does has come prepared about with a little spiel about something about the sets. And that something is the fixing in this set. So, Mark, I'll just send it to you. What's uh, what's your message to the people? Yeah, I like to give, I guess, a little mini predicted state of the format for each of these. Yeah. And some of them have been closer to reality than others. Um, but for this set, I think the overwhelming takeaway is it's probably the best fixing out of any set I can I can I can possibly remember. Mm, like I don't yeah. know if maybe there's one that comes to mind for you that might be better. But there's common duels, there's multiple five color lands, there's creatures, you know, there's artifact creatures that fix your mana, there's tons of green things that let you fetch out lands and fix colors. So I do think that this set will be very fluid in regards to the colors of your deck and even the golden commons, we didn't really see a reason to be like specifically two colors or specifically extremely certain type of, of aggression right? right yeah like in a lot of sets you see okay this is the red white uncommon and then it wants you to put these cards in your deck and then you kind of go and with this set i think there's going to be interesting points in not just drafting your mana in terms of fluidity from two colors three colors four colors five colors there's also going to be some fluidity in how much you want to push a specific theme right because you can play outlaws and if i say hey alex what does an outlaw deck look like to you like right now on the spot could you come up with like a shell i'd it, it would look so different from the next person yeah because there's outlaws across less in green but pretty much all five colors and so if you have an outlaw payoff it doesn't mean you need to be like a color pair you can be a wedge or a shard or four colors or five colors same thing happens with plot same thing happens with, you know, double spelling and taking turns off and playing instants and playing deserts. So the other axis that I think is going to be really interesting in this set is gauging the, I talked about this a little bit already, but the value versus um, tempo slash aggressive side of things. Because the plot cards put you in an interesting spot where you can cast them as like understated on curve drops, mm -hmm. right? So you can just play your 3-2 for 3 mana or your 3-4 for 3 mana that we'll be, we'll be getting to later. If you're like far enough behind, you may have to do that in a lot of games, but you're going to have to decide, am I still going to win the game if it goes long, if I give up on all of my potential value for this? So I really think, again, this is a Dave Humphrey set. He's excellent at designing sets. He's probably done a lot of this. I've heard him say that plot was one of, if not the favorite mechanic that he's ever designed and i do think a lot of that's going to be on the tension for gameplay saying how much value not only how much value can i squeeze out of these cards but how much can i afford to squeeze out of these cards yeah totally yeah i was I actually go forward yeah sorry go, go. Oh, no, 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 no. okay yeah I'll, I'll say my part too i was gonna say i actually had a mini thing to say about plot when we got to a few plot cards but you kind of said it too i think that's the real puzzle of the gameplay like the tension of like can you afford to plot Will you have the time to? And if not, you just play your card. And that's a decision. I think that's actually a really tricky decision because a lot of, um, you know, a lot of limited players, magic players in general, really just want to get all the value out of their card possible. But sometimes you, you just have to suck it up and just play your card on curve that, you know, your four mana three, four no ETB, ETB right? Um, but yeah, that it's learning when you should and when you can and when you can't is going to be a big part of learning the set. Yeah. The, the one downside of having such good fixing is it does often mean that if there's a color that's worse, you don't really end up in a reason to end up going that color mm -hmm. because the best cards from that color can just be cannibalized by by other decks, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not, so it's not like if if black is is underdrafted, then you can just like 
get rewarded by getting late really good black cards because whoever's five color soup deck is going to pick it up well before it gets to you. So I do think the, the good cards in this format are just going to be like always pickable and the bad cards are just going to be like almost never play. But that's potentially more of a feature than a drawback for this set because we already saw coming off MKM that it was kind of hard to stay super flexible and stay open and like shift your draft into different colors because of the reduced amount of cards in each pack. And that was something that the hybrid cards helped out with initially to make it a little bit easier to say, okay, even if you're blue, white, you can play the, the blue, red hybrid card and the white, you know, black hybrid card. So for this set, I do think the fact that you should almost perhaps go in thinking you're going to be playing multiple colors or splashing a few things. And that way, your first pick of the draft, I think is going to make your deck an extremely high percentage of the time in this yeah. set. No, that's that's a really good way of putting it. Um, and, and just to, well, actually, did, anything else that you wanted to put out there before we move on? If if not, no, no, okay, no, 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 sweet. No, yeah, no. I was just gonna say that uh, if you have not joined us for one of these set reviews before, with that little, you know, those little gems of uh, wisdom that Mark provides, uh, they are very, very often correct. Like you, you go back to our set reviews of other things and the things that Mark goes, yo, I think this is gonna be true about this set. They end up being right. So, uh, yeah, look out for those. I, I think that this one, I mean, I, I definitely agree with what, what he just said there, too. So don't uh, don't overlook it. 